but they are integrally connected. We have organisms that live part of their life in one and the rest of their life in another. We have some organisms that move from one to the other um, over different parts of the day. There's material that moves between these different systems. There's energy that moves between these systems. And really, each one of these requires the other ones in order to be healthy. Now, I won't do a lot with fish today. Um, I'm more of an invertebrate biologist. And if you are going snorkeling, my experience has been the guides that you go with are really, really good at helping to identify and point out the interesting fish that you're going to see. So we'll do a little bit of fish, but we'll look more at some other things that often the guides um, think you won't be as interested in, but I know you will be. So here are some fish. So the upper left-hand corner we have, and these are all fish that will be uh, relatively common on your snorkels. Uh, I saw all of these weeks ago. Um, upper left is a blue striped grunt. It's called a grunt because they actually physically make noise. Um, these are fish that when you see them during the daytime, they're very lazy. They're not doing much. That's about as close as they get to sleep. It's at night when they're really moving around. In the middle, we have a gray angelfish. And there are different types of angelfish that you will run into, but they all have that same basic body shape that many of you can just recognize and say, yeah, that's an angelfish. Angelfish love to eat sponges. So if you see an angelfish feeding on something, mm, you may not be great at identifying sponges, but that will be a really good indicator that that's what you're looking at there. The upper right-hand corner is one of my favorites. This is the bicolor damselfish. It's only about three inches long, but this is the chihuahua of the reef. Okay, I've got a chihuahua. My wife has a chihuahua at home, uh, and Marcia is about this big, but she thinks she's about this big, and that's the way these bicolored damselfish are. How do they make a living? They're farmers. So a damselfish will stake out a little piece of reef um, about the size of a tabletop, and it then farms algae in that section of reef that it's claimed for itself. It plants some algae, it keeps other organisms from eating the algae. It fertilizes the algae with its own feces. And if anybody else tries to get in there, the damselfish is out there trying to get rid of them, drive them away. It doesn't matter how big that other fish is. Now, one thing that I really try to encourage you to do as you snorkel is not to physically interact with the wildlife. Leave them alone. Just watch them. But I think the bicolor damselfish can be an exception to that rule because it spends its entire day driving away other fish. And if you would like to make your hand be a little bit of a fish in its area, you'll see how aggressive this guy can, can be. It'll come up, it'll charge you. It will try to drive you away. Next on the list, we have a stoplight parrotfish. There are many parrotfish out there. This one is called stoplight because it has the three basic colors, red, yellow, and green. Parrotfish are important herbivores that eat a lot of algae on the reef but they also have big, strong jaws and kind of scary looking teeth. What do they do with those teeth? Well, they can bite coral. Sometimes you'll see a perfectly healthy coral head, but it's got little chunks taken out of it, about that big. That's because parrotfish have been feeding on that. Lower right hand corner is probably the most common fish that you'll see when you're snorkeling around here. It's a sergeant major. They're only about four inches long. They come in flashy little schools. They're great to take pictures of. If you're in an area where the guides have been maybe giving them a little encouragement, a little food here and there, you'll find that these sergeant majors are extremely friendly. And there's this guy. I talked last week or two weeks ago about the fact that sometimes you can see a five-foot barracuda. And in fact, we went snorkeling at St. Thomas and right through the middle of the group, there came a magnificent five foot barracuda. Don't be nervous of these guys. There are all sorts of stories that people tell about them. They're a predator, but they're what we call a gape limited predator, which means they want to eat something that will fit in their mouth. They don't want to take a bite out of something big. So these guys are, um, they're predators, so they're, they're smarter than most of the other fish up here. They have to be, um, but they're not aggressive, but they're very curious. So they may come a little close. Lower left-hand corner is the four-eyed butterfly fish. Again, there are many sorts of butterfly fish out there, um, but they all have the same basic body format. 
And these fish are doing something that many animals do across the animal world. They're using a false eye spot to tell a lie. So many predators, when they're looking for their prey, they focus in on that eye because it helps them to figure out what's going on. If you're a barracuda, you don't have hands to catch your prey. All you have is your mouth. So you have to aim at that prey and swim as fast as you can to catch them in your mouth. Well, where do you aim? Fish are very poor at swimming backwards. So when that little fish gets eventually scared and see you, sees you coming, it will scoot off headed forward. So the barracuda would tend to focus on that front end. Many fish, if they're not experienced, they'll mistake that false eye spot for an eye. They'll think that's the front end. They'll focus on that left-hand side. And when they get there, that fish has scooted off just a little bit. Of course, much of the time that you're snorkeling, you'll be spending on coral reefs. And I had a lecture yesterday to talk about coral, as I said, um, how we classify them, how they live. Uh, and I'll just give you some basics on the coral that you may see. Um, the hard corals are corals that have a calcium carbonate skeleton, a limestone skeleton, which is covered by a very thin layer of living tissue, about an eighth of an inch thick. And the first two corals that I have up here are called the branching corals because that's their body morphology. They're shaped kind of like a bush or kind of like a tree, and these are the two most common branching corals that you would see. Now, most corals grow very slowly, half an inch a year maybe. Branching corals can grow a foot a year, and that's an adaptation for them. If a storm comes through, breaks off pieces, the pieces can live, the pieces can grow. But by growing that fast, they've sort of pushed their physiology to the limits. So if they get stressed, then they really start to have problems. These are the most sensitive corals that you'll see on the reef. Um, I was impressed to see both of these on one of the snorkels last week, um, two weeks ago. And uh, this is the basic way that these will look for you. So branching corals sort of have that tree-like or bush-like form. The massive corals tend to be large sort of spherical structures. And the easiest ones to spot are the brain corals. They do have this kind of brain-like uh, appearance. And you won't have any trouble spotting them. But with just a little bit of help, you can identify which specific brain corals you're looking at. So here are two. On the left, we have the common brain coral. On the right, we have the large grooved brain coral. And when we talk about coral morphology, how it's put together, we refer to hills and valleys those grooves and bulges that you see, we call hills and valleys, and extremely creative of us as, as biologists, right? So I tell my students that the one on the left, the common brain coral, is sort of the boring one. That's the easiest way to remember it, common, boring. It has a simple hill, you can see the rounded hills there, and a simple valley in between those hills. The color is also a pretty good clue. On the right, you'll see that the large grooved brain coral still has those hills and valleys, but on the tops of those hills, there's a little path. There's a little groove that runs along that, as if you were hiking along the top of a hill and had a path to follow. Two other brain corals that are very common. I saw these a couple of weeks ago. On the left is maize coral, because it looks a little bit like a maze that you might wander through. And on the right is tan brain coral. That color is a real good giveaway. And you can also see those little ridges that come out, and those are referred to as septa. So those are probably the four most common brain corals that you see. Now when you snorkel over a coral, don't just say, that's a coral and I'm moving on, because corals actually serve as living space, as substrate for many other organisms on the reef. So this is a close-up of, you can see, boring coral, that's common brain coral, but poking out of it, you have a Christmas tree worm, actually two of them. They're called that because of the way they're shaped, kind of look like little Christmas trees. And these are actually related to the earthworms that you have in your gardens. A little fancier, have a little bit more structure to them, and they have the ability to burrow down into a coral to give themselves a place to live. If they get startled, if they get disturbed, they pull down inside, they'll disappear for 30 seconds or a minute, and then you'll see them slowly poke back out. 
you can see that those Christmas tree worms also are providing some shade, some shelter for a couple of little fish lined gobies. So you have complex relationships here. So take your time. Don't just snorkel over something and, and move on to the next because there are often many things that you can spot that on first inspection you might miss. So all of those are hard corals. Those are the corals with the calcium carbonate or limestone skeletons. What you see here in the middle is a fan coral. They do not have a, a limestone skeleton. They have a protein-based skeleton, so they don't build reefs. Um, when they die, they kind of fall apart. But they're nice and flexible. They flow back and forth in that current, and um, you will see many of these. Once again, don't just swim by that fan coral. Take a look, because on their surface, very often, you can see this guy. This is the flamingo tongue snail. It's one of the most beautiful organisms on the reef. It has this beautiful leopard spot pattern. And what it's doing on that fan coral is feeding. So you'll see the flamingo tongue snail in one spot, and then behind it often a little trail. Looks like it's mowed its way across that fan coral. It's actually fed on the living coral tissue. They don't really tend to do much harm. Normally you see just one little flamingo tongue snail on the big fan coral, and that fan coral has the ability to repair itself. Um, but these are pretty spectacular little snails. Now, that structure that you see on the outside with all the bright colors is called a mantle. And all mollusks, clams, squid, octopus, snails have a mantle. In most cases it secretes the shell, in most cases you don't see it. But on the flamingo tongue snail, it's on the outside. Now, if they get disturbed, if they get bothered, they suck that mantle back inside, and all you see is the white shell on the outside. So you may see this guy looking one of two different ways.